Hello and welcome to the 14th lecture in the Asian Development Bank 3IE video lecture series. In this lecture, we'll focus on social protection, and in particular, the potential for social protection interventions to impact on education outcomes. The social protection sector includes several interventions that can help households facing financial hardship, such as the transfers of in-kind materials or cash, pension programs, and public works programs. In this lecture, we'll first look at the theory of change that suggests why cash transfers may be able to affect education outcomes, and then we'll look at a specific example from Cambodia, where the researchers use a regression discontinuity design to try to estimate the causal impact of a conditional cash transfer on educational outcomes of interest. Finally, we'll look at the balance of evidence from a systematic review about how cash transfers may impact on educational outcomes. So while the idea of conditional cash transfers are not new, they have gained popularity in the last 15 years since an experimental program and well-designed evaluation made them a popular idea. The idea behind a conditional cash transfer is that families fa facing high financial hardship receive cash transfers, but only by fulfilling certain conditions, such as taking their children for health checkups or enrolling them in school. In 1997 is when this evaluation was publicized in Mexico, and since then, the idea has spread throughout Latin America and more recently, Africa and Asia, including at least five programs currently operational in Asia. Because of this, the uh, idea of conditional cash transfers have become an extremely well-studied area of development economics. In fact, maybe one of the most studied areas. But there is still some debate about the best way to structure cash transfers in order to help families in financial hardship. Some people argue that the cash transfer should come without conditions because while households lack money, they don't lack rational priorities about how to allocate that money to improve their welfare. On the other hand, there are several reasons why cash transfers with conditions may be better. First, it may be that families undervalue the true benefit of education or overvalue the true costs and therefore don't make decisions that would make them better in the long run. Also, when you add a condition, you might induce a change because not only do you give the cash transfer, which improves income, but you change the relative price of schooling because those cash transfers don't come unless the child is enrolled in an intense school. Finally, conditional cash transfers may be more politically feasible than unconditional ones because you're able to tell donors and taxpayers that you're not just giving a handout, that you're actually inducing pro-social behaviors and that those financial transfers are not given unless those conditions are met. So now let's think about the theory of change. Why would we expect a cash transfer to potentially impact on educational outcomes? In order for that to happen, in order to improve test scores or other measures of academic achievement, children need to be enrolled in school and attend school. And prior to that, we need the link of income between the cash transfer and enrolling in school, which may allow families to cover school fees, uniform costs, costs of attending school otherwise. And usually with cash transfer programs, there's an eligibility criterion which makes the families able to receive these cash transfers. So this is our basic causal chain. So while this is the basic causal chain, there are moderating factors that make it more or less likely that one link of the chain will lead to the next one. For example, for children to attend school and have this translate into academic achievement, it depends whether the teachers themselves are present, whether they are adequately trained to give the instruction they're expected to give, and whether they put in the effort. Similarly, the link between income and actually enrolling in school will depend, for example, on the size of the transfer relative to the school fees and therefore whether the transfer can cover the full cost of the fees. And remember that when we talk about conditional cash transfers as opposed to unconditional, we add a feedback loop. If one of the conditions of receiving the transfer is having the child attend school, then attendance one month feeds back and it affects eligibility in later time periods. So now that we have this theory of change in mind, let's look at a specific impact evaluation example where the researchers wanted to ask, what is the causal or attributable impact of being offered a cash transfer on educational outcomes of interest? For example, enrollment, attendance, and test scores. In this particular case in Cambodia, scholarships, which were effectively conditional cash transfers, were offered to low-income households that had students that were about to start the lower secondary school cycle, which in Cambodia covers grades 7, 8, and 9. In this particular case, the government structured the program to pay out the transfer three times a year, conditional on the students enrolling in and attending school as well as progressing from grade to grade. And in this case, the amount of the transfer 
covered the cost of the school fees, but nothing else, so just the direct costs. So now let's look at how selection into the process worked, because the selection and the eligibility criterion is what allows these researchers to estimate causal impact of the program. So first, the government looked at all the secondary schools in the country and chose those that were specifically in underserved areas where there were already high levels of non-enrollment and high levels of dropout. They then looked at the primary schools that fed into those secondary schools and had all sixth grade students fill out a small application form where they gave details about household assets and other aspects of socioeconomic well-being. Using these data and a particular algorithm, they then calculated a dropout risk score for each of the students, so the, the risk of the student not progressing from sixth to seventh grade. And it's this criterion that we're going to see them use for the regression discontinuity design. Now, once they assessed the dropout risk score, they chose the lower 30 or lower 50, depending on the size of the school, students in order to offer the scholarship to. So now let's see how they use that eligibility criterion to estimate the causal impact of this program on enrollment, attendance, and test scores. Remember from video lecture four that a regression discontinuity design is one of the ways of estimating causal impact, and it's a particular way of setting up the comparison group. Remember that causal impact questions require us to ask what would have happened in the absence of the program so that we can attribute the true effect. So we need to identify a comparison group to do this. And one way to construct the comparison group is to use the cutoff from an eligibility criterion from a program like a conditional cash transfer to separate treatment from comparison group. So the cutoff creates a discontinuity that is very useful. Now let's consider how the researchers use this discontinuity in order to estimate the causal impact of the program. Let's consider hypothetical large school A, in the Cambodia case this means a school with more than 200 students, to understand what the researchers did. Here we have an array of dropout risk scores, with the score of 50 representing a particularly high risk of dropping out between 6th and 7th grade, and 11 representing a relatively lower risk. For this particular school, where we're going to offer the scholarship to the 50 students with the highest risk of dropping out, let's say that the cutoff falls at 36, such that those have a, that have a score of higher than 36 will be offered the scholarship, and those with a score lower than 36 will not. Now remember that we want to have a comparison group. We may not feel very comfortable comparing those students with a very high risk of 50 with those with a lower risk of 11. But we may feel more comfortable saying that those on either side of the discontinuity were similar prior to the program, and that the main difference between them is going to be the offer of the program, that is, the treatment. So the main identifying assumption that we need for this is that the students on either side of the cutoff were truly the same prior to being offered the program, and the program is the only thing that makes them different from each other. So now let's look at some of the results. On this graph, on the x-axis, we have the relative risk of dropping out. And on the y-axis, we're going to have the proportion of students that are attending school. Again, we see the eligibility cutoff, such that those on the left of the cutoff will be those that were offered the scholarship, and on the right, those that were not. So here are the results for those that were eligible. And this is the classic graph that you want to see in a regression discontinuity design. And we expect to see a distinct jump between those that were eligible and those that were not in the outcome of interest. And indeed, in this case, we do see that jump. In fact, there's a 25 percentage point difference in attendance between those who were offered the scholarship and those who were not. But notice that when we change the outcome of, of interest from attendance to test scores, the discontinuity goes away. That is, the scholarship does not seem to change test scores among students, even though it does change attendance. So now let's think about this Cambodia study within the balance of evidence from a systematic review that looks at cash transfers and, again, academic achievement. The results from systematic reviews are often displayed on a forest plot, which is what we have here. On the x-axis, we, we see the line of no effect. And on the x-axis to the left of this, we have programs that actually decrease test scores as a result of offering treatment. And on the right, we have the outcome that we actually would like to see, which is an improvement of test scores as a result of uh, offering the treatment to the students. So here's our Cambodia program that we've already looked at. And as we see, offering the scholarship actually seems to slightly lower test scores. But with the balance of evidence, we see that other programs have no effect or a slightly positive effect. 
and our cumulative pooled effect size suggests no or a slightly positive effect of being offered a conditional cash transfer on educational outcomes. So in sum, we have looked at a theory of change of why we'd expect cash transfers, one of the main social protection interventions, to improve an outcome like educational achievement. We then looked at a specific example from Cambodia that used a regression discontinuity design to try to estimate impact and found a positive impact on enrollment and attendance, but not test scores. And this was very much in line with the results that we also saw in the systematic review that included our Cambodia study, as well as several other studies. So while it is fair to say that conditional cash transfers have been highly studied, there's still a lot of work to understand how social protection interventions can affect all of the outcomes of interest, enrollment, attendance, as well as academic achievement. I hope this has been able to teach you something important about social protection, and thanks for watching.